on this episode, Pat Boone, iconic legend. We're here and we're grateful. And I got to tell you something, you have the patience of Joel. Yes, you do. Well, I'm, I'm dumb but happy. Oh, believe me, um, you couldn't have graduated with the top of the honors that you did from college. <laughs> you dumb, my dear. Uh, I have learned so much about you. We have an introduction that's coming in uh, prior to what you're knowing. I don't think, and I wrote, is there anything he hasn't done? That's what I wrote. In your accomplishments, which you said, being married to Mama Shirley, Shirley, his wife, my mentor, Mama Shirley, uh, yeah. you know, 65 years is your greatest accomplishment. Yeah, it is. It is. What a great thing to say. Accomplishment and, and the one that has brought me the most satisfaction and, and love and, and gratitude, really. Well, yeah. I'm certainly glad it turned out this way because she could never have gone on without you. Oh, I don't know. She had a lot going for her, but, but I grabbed her when she was just 16 first. I couldn't and believe then, And then 19 when we got married. I can't believe how the picture of the four children with you in a cap and gown yes. with Shirley. I mean, what's the chances of this? Come on, seriously. And graduating, cap and gown, you open up the TV guide, because the picture of that, of that, that picture was on the cover of TV guide. Yeah. And then you open up the TV guide, and there's a picture of Shirley and the four little girls. And we're both 23. We're 23 yeah. years old, and I'm graduating from college. Well, that was not that unusual at 23. But to have a hit television show, records and movies, and a ma wife and four kids, <laughs> well, actually, this comes a long way from being a school teacher and a preacher, don't you think? Yeah, yes. <laughs> and, and sometimes I've wondered, couldn't help but wonder what my life would have been like had I, you know, done what I thought I was going to do. By the way, you look beautiful. Oh, thank you. You, you know, I should thank have. You. I should have uh, had somebody handle some lighting and makeup for me. Listen, these people are so good to me. It's favor. I mean, but I have to tell you something, not because you said it, but I pray that you'd wear a collar because I love the collars on you. I watch all your shows, you know. I do. Got to cover these waddles somehow. Oh, believe me, I'm starting to do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why, Patrick Charles Eugene Boone? Who is Charles? Who's Eugene? Both. I'm both of them. I'm, I'm a the triple personality. <laughs> you uh, certainly I, are. I, I've often said Shirley felt like she was married to triplets <laughs> and wished two of them would get away, go away. <laughs> because I stayed as busy as three people. What she but, call you, the energized bunny? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Charles Eugene Boone is my name. That's the name on my birth certificate. But my parents had expected a girl. This was before amniocentesis, so there was no way of knowing. And they had already picked out the name Patricia and were already calling her Pat when I was born. And then on close inspection, they realized that they had made an error, <laughs> that I was not a girl. And so they named me Charles and Eugene after my two grandfathers and then kept on calling me Pat anyway. My name was never Patrick. It was Charles Eugene, but but they just uh, kept calling me Pat, and that's what I've always been called. I noticed in some of the earlier My shows, mistake. I was a big, I was a big mistake to begin with. I, I don't I don't think for our world I don't think there's anything that happens in our world, especially somebody that's as anointed as you are, would be called a mistake. <laughs> uh, my dear brother Pat, just so you know. Well, I thank you. <laughs> well, it's honest. I have to. I uh, speak honest. I'll tell you what got me the most is when I was a kid growing up, we were not allowed to watch Elvis Presley um, on Sullivan show unless they shot waist, waist high. Is that right? Yeah, Help me. right. Yeah. They didn't I, want to show below the waist. Right. I mean, they didn't want to see what was going on down there. Right. And yet when I'm <laughs> doing all, much. No, of course not. But he didn't have on the white boots either. Um, no, but actually the first time I saw him, he did have on some scuffed up white, bu white bucks because that's what all us kids at that time were wearing. And he and I were both kids at the same time. I think I was um, six months older than Elvis. 
and I had an 11 month head start on him career wise, thank God. But when we met in Cleveland, uh, he was wearing some long pants, a little too long, and they were sort of drooped down over uh, some scuffed up white buck shoes because that's what we all were wearing. And I just happened to be the first to wear them on TV. And the kids, it was not in, not ex, not premeditated, but the kids were saying, "Look, there's one of us on TV." <laughs> I was, but and so they, the white bucks, became totally identified with me. Totally, I mean that in milk. Milk. I was a big milk drinker, and that leaked out. People learned that I was hooked on the white stuff. Yeah. The <laughs> milk. Yeah, you know. I don't know if you had a press agent back then, but you certainly got to be the number one pop star from the 50s and 60s. I mean, when I see, I'm jumping ahead of myself because I'm so excited. I cannot believe how much you have accomplished. I mean, we're going to talk about a gamut of things today. I didn't know about your books. In fact, I have a few behind me today, but not the 55 that I counted on the on the sheet that I tore out. I cannot believe how many things you've done. So it's hard for me to know where to begin. I know a lot of people want to start with Elvis opened for you. I understand that, but mm -hmm. you're so much deeper than that, Pat. I mean, oh. well, uh, as you know, uh, what, what depth I may exhibit comes from the, my intention when I married Shirley at 19 was to be a teacher preacher. That's what I thought my life was going to be about because I was a product of a Christian education uh, and Christian home. And when Shirley and I married at 19 and we're thinking, well, how am I going to, what am I going to do to make a living? I wanted to pattern myself after my uh, Christian college and Christian school role models. They were teacher preachers. And I thought, well, that's the worth, most worthwhile way I could spend my life is to be a teacher preacher. And, and, and I wanted to be able to be involved in the lives of other young people as these role models had been in mine. And I would teach English, a fairly easy subject. But in the course of that, even in a secular school, I would be trying to help kids go in the right direction and share the Lord with them and, and biblical principles and try to, try to uh, influence them while the twig was being bent, you know, because these days... And, and it wasn't quite as bad then. The kids, when they go to school today, can have their faith taught out of them. I mean, they, they can have been Sunday school kids when they come to school, and then have, they have teachers today that won't even allow them say the name Jesus in school, and they certainly can't have a prayer before the school day. And, and so many of the teachers these days are so afraid of offending somebody without faith that they won't let real faith, unless you're Muslim, if you're Muslim, of course, they they will make room for you and time mm -hmm. for you to engage in your Muslim faith. But, of course, that doesn't involve the rest of the student body. No, in fact, it's a real problem that we're up against today. It's been coming for a long time. I heard you speak at the Heritage House a few years ago about what was coming. And exactly yeah. what you said at the Heritage House that you wrote personally is happening. Yeah. Yeah. The In some cases, things that we dreaded and didn't think could happen in this country are happening. That is, today imagine that certain passages of Scripture, even quoted from the pulpit, much less a schoolroom or in some other public situation, can be prosecuted as hate speech <laughs> if, it, if it violates current uh, political and social mores, then it can seem that you're being, you know, your religion is causing you to be somehow prejudiced against other people. You know, in this country, we could always express our faith, whatever it was, or even our non-faith. And it was our freedom to express ourselves however we want. The freedom. And other people didn't feel intimidated. Now, if school kids say something about Jesus, school teachers are so afraid, they'll say, but now the other kids will think that uh, that you're somehow prejudiced against them. And the kids say, no, I just say that Jesus is the one that I think I'd most like to meet if I could, or the most influential person in my life, as a, maybe they were assigned. 
but no, you can't say Jesus. Pick something else. Because there might be two other people in the class that might be offended. And I don't think they would be offended unless somebody told them they should be. <laughs> well, I, I, do. I think we do see, as I see what you, let me rephrase that, as I see what you have done with your life and continue to do, I mean, there's so much here, richness, such richness in your life. I mean, from, I mean, I'm studying from, uh, from the Chevy show, which, uh, which you did and why you got the Chevy show as opposed to the beer commercials that you refused mm-hmm. to do. Yeah. I, I mean, you, you took a stand. That. You took a stand. Yeah. Uh, your, your viewers won't know what that's about, <clears throat> but my records took off in a hurry, and uh, to my amazement, I mean, I did a couple of rock and roll songs. They were called Rhythm and Blues. We call mine rock and roll. Uh, Tutti Frutti and uh, two, par- two Hearts, Two Kisses, and Ain't That a Shame. Yeah, right. All of a sudden, I'm having hit records, and now uh, the agents mm-hmm. from General Artist Corporation, the biggest talent agency, came and said, uh, uh, you want to do your own television show? I said, well, I'm only 20 years old, but sure, I'd love to do that. 21. And, uh, and I said, who will the sponsor be? And they said, uh, uh, Chesterfield Cigarettes. <laughs> I said, oh, but I don't smoke. Well, that doesn't matter. Uh, Perry Como is sponsored by, I think, Chesterfield or one of the cigarettes companies, and he doesn't smoke much either. I said, but isn't the idea, if I'm going to be sponsored by some product, that I'm encouraging teenage kids who are tuning in to see me to use that product. Well, you're thinking too much. Just let them do the commercials and you sing your songs. But I said, but isn't the sum effect of that, that I'm selling cigarettes? I can't do it. And so the agents went away shaking their heads. Well, this, this guy's not for this business. They came back later, said, uh, you, would you still like to do your TV show? And I said, well, sure. Who would the sponsor be? They said, Schlitz beer. I said, wait a minute, I don't drink beer either. Well, you don't have to drink beer, just sing your songs. I said, but maybe I'm wrong, but the purpose of the sponsor sponsoring my show is to sell his product. And the reason they want me is because I have a lot of teenage fans. So aren't they going to be trying to sell Schlitz beer to, to my fans? Well, you know, they couldn't deny that. And so they went away again, thinking to my manager, saying to my manager, take this boy back to Tennessee. He's not for this business. But eventually they came to see me again with my manager and and sort of beating around the bush. He said, "Uh, have you got anything against Chevrolet? (laughs) I said, no, no. Driving a Chevrolet right now, a 1950 Chevrolet with about 120,000 miles on it. I love Chevrolet. But they gave you two cars, didn't they? Well, they did from then on, yes, because they sponsored the show. And from then on, every year, a brand new fuel injection Corvette <laughs> and a big top of the line uh, Chevy station wagon. And, uh, and I, so I had all my transportation needs taken care of and, and handsomely. And of course, yeah. I was happy to, to sell the, uh, the virtues of Chevrolet because I was driving Chevrolets myself. Yeah, they were well, a great sponsor. Well, great sponsor. You did the show for three years? Three years for Chevy. And then I left uh, the half hour format. And you know something about that, why I did, why I quit doing that, because it was a problem with Chevrolet by that time. And then I went to specials, TV specials, and hosted a lot of specials. And then after that, did two or three other series along the way for NBC, Filmways, and um, I may be forgetting another one, ABC perhaps, uh, and also one for CBN eventually, a series. But the one for Chevrolet ended when uh, Chevrolet was getting plenty of problems uh, from their customers down south because I was having so many black performers on my show. I mean, I I was thrilled to have Sammy Davis and the Mills Brothers and Johnny Mathis and Ella Fitzgerald and Nat King Cole come on and sing with me on my show. Are you kidding? And then Little Richard and Fats Domino and some of the R&B artists. But it turned out that uh, I didn't know it. Chevrolet was getting problems with their 
many of their viewers, their buyers, customers in the South, because it was the mid fifties, late fifties and prejudice in the South was still very strong. And I was shocked when Henry, when Harry Belafonte called me one day, the biggest entertainer in the world and said, I like the way you treat your guests. Would you like me to come on your show and sing with you? And I said, I would certainly love it, Mr. Belafonte. And, uh, and so I went to the meeting with, our, with Chevrolet and ABC and the ad agents. I said, you're not going to believe this. Harry Belafonte is called and wants to come on my show and sing with me. And they looked at me with these stony looks like, no, we can't do that. I said, why? What do you mean? Well, because, and then they started telling me about the problem that Chevy was having with its customers in the South and that Harry Belafonte was already now uh, outspoken in civil rights. And therefore they could not envision having him come on my show. Well, I was so taken back by that, that I didn't say anything for a while, but later in that same meeting, I said, fellas, if I have to say no to Harry Belafonte, this says this is the Pat Boone Chevy show, but it's not the Pat Boone show if Pat Boone has to say no to Harry Belafonte because he's a black man and because he has civil rights ideas, which, which of course are no offense to me. And they said, well, you're going to walk off your own show for that? I said, look, it's more than that. You know that. It's a big problem. I'm from the South. I know the problem, but I'm not going to be part of it. So, yeah, you're going to have to get somebody else to take the show from here. Well, it turned out they relented. They said, well, if you can guarantee that there won't be any civil rights statements if Harry Belafonte comes on your, on your show, then, you know, we'll try it. And I said, look, Harry Belafonte is a gentleman. I, I can tell him what the problem is with the South down with Chevy. And just the fact that he and I are singing together on my show is enough of a statement. No more statements have to be made. And I'm sure he'll appreciate that and, and agree. Well, it didn't happen because it was toward the end of my series. We already had um, the shows booked. Harry Belafonte had other things to do. So I decided I wasn't going to continue with that show anymore, and I left it. And that's when I, Shirley and I moved to California to this house where I'm talking to you now. <laughs> and, and, uh, and we've lived here 60 well, 60 years. You bought that and, 1960, uh, Pat? It was Not 1960, 90. yeah. Beautiful home. Whole corner. The whole corner. The corner of, of Beverly and Sunset, right next to the Beverly Hills Hotel. So close, ah. I, could order, I could order food from the Beverly Hills Hotel. But <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want to pay their prices. No, oh, well, you have girls in the house there, those wonderful women that help you out, so. Yeah, they take turns. It's not all at once. It's not well, a sorority, but, or a sorority house. They take turns. But then my little Cocker Spaniel <laughs> shadow. Shadow. Keeps me company. <laughs> me and my shadow, all alone and feeling blue. Anyway. You know, you know one of the things when you're talking about the Chevy show, just to complete that, I'm, I'm jumping ahead and we'll get back to so much. There's so much to your life. It's unbelievable. But I mean, you faced a same or similar problem when you were in South Africa. Well, I didn't go to South Africa at first because they were asking. My, my songs were big. The movies were big. And I was being asked to come all over the world to perform. But when they asked me to come to South Africa, I had only heard about this policy. I wasn't sure how to pronounce apartheid, apartheid, apartheid. No, they said apartheid. I said, it, that, it, it, do I understand that if I come to South Africa, people who have money to buy tickets to come hear me and see me, if they're black or brown or some other color, they can't come. And they said, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, uh, our policy only will perform but there's, there's several thousands or millions of people, white people that want to come hear you sing. I said, well, you know, I can't tell you how to run your country. It's your country. <laughs> but, and we've got our own problems here in America, but I'm just not comfortable coming to South Africa. If I know that there are people of another color who would like to come hear me sing and they they can't do it. 
because of that racial problem. So I'm thank you for the invite, and the money would be great, but I I won't do it. Well, they they I turned them down twice, but the third time they came. It's interesting that uh, I have to turn something down three times. I haven't thought of it too much. But they came the third time behind closed doors. They said, look, if you'll give us your gentleman's word, you won't publicize it. If you will come and do your concerts in South Africa, the government will suspend the policy of apartheid for your concerts. And let it be known that anybody who wants to buy a ticket of any color, any race, can come hear you sing. I said, that's anywhere, wherever I perform, there'll be no restrictions. They said, that's right. So I went in 1960, the same year I moved into this house. I hadn't thought of that either. But I went to South Africa, and we, I performed in Johannesburg and in uh, Durban and Pretoria and other places in uh, South Africa, and then up into northern Rhodesia, which was then called, yeah, Rhodesia, and it's called Zimbabwe now. <laughs> but they lifted the policy of apartheid and blacks, browns, yellows, greens, purples, anybody, it didn't matter what color they were, they could come see me sing. I did have death threats. We had special people, security people in the audiences watching for anybody that might decide to take me out because I did get uh, threats at the, my hotel where I'd be staying that if you go on stage in front of a of a uh, non-segregated audience, uh, 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 what am I trying to say, a diverse audience, Yes. that you may not leave the stage uh, alive. So I've laughed about it, but it's true that where I used to <laughs> perform pretty much in the center of the stage at the microphone, I didn't move around too much, didn't have to, but on those shows in South Africa, I bobbed and weaved and I moved around that stage and, uh, <laughs> and always looking in the audience to see if I saw somebody look like he might be raising a gun. And we had people in the audience uh, armed and ready to take out somebody if he, or to, you know, stop somebody if he was going to really try to shoot me. And so, uh, you know, it came off without incidents except for the threats. And uh, and I came, as soon as I came home, the, poli- the policy fell right back down and was in place. And for years after that, there were no performers in uh, in uh, diverse audiences. Now, and blacks. do you attribute that to your faith or just being a man of courage? Well, to me, it was just common sense. I mean, it was, <laughs> uh, yes, faith, because um, it didn't seem right to me or righteous that people just because of the color of their skin couldn't come to hear me or anybody else they wanted to hear or see. But, but it just seemed um, just wrong. I mean, I, I, I just felt like I could not be part of it any more than I could be part of, of not having Harry Belafonte on my television show because it was wrong. So it's the same stance you continue to take through these different arenas. Some things are right. Some things are wrong. And it's not always clear Sometimes yeah. it can be gray areas, but if for me something was just flat wrong, it didn't appeal to me. I didn't want to do it. But you had the courage to stand on that. You had feeding children, four children, and your wife, and you still took the stand. Yeah, but I can't act like it. It was going to be a financial thing because I was making enough money with the records and movies and TV. <laughs> that I was, it wasn't a financial thing. I was always happy to get paid, but, uh, but it was not that. It was just simply as simple as it being right or wrong. I, I turned down movie roles that I really want, like one with Marilyn Monroe, I think I may have told you, when I was at 20th Century Fox, under contract. They wanted me to do a movie with Marilyn Monroe, and I would have played a young guy um, still in school, maybe high school or first year of college. She she plays a beautiful, but slightly tilting toward being over the hill performer, coming back to her Midwestern town where she grew up to, to, to decide what she wants to do with the rest of her life. And there's a romance that takes place between this kid and her uh, and a, becomes an illicit romance. That is, they weren't married. 
but you know, even already at that point, it would be the kind of thing you'd root for. You say, oh yeah, well look, they're in love. Why not? And boy, I'd like to be having an affair with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Who wouldn't? But um, I had to say to the head of the studio, Buddy Adler, I'm sorry, Mr. Adler, I can't do this. I'd love to make a movie with Marilyn Monroe, but this is a very immoral story. I've got teenage fans, and this fan, this story is going to make it look like it's okay, that it was beautiful, really, for the kid and, and her to be in love and have an affair, and it couldn't, couldn't last, but, but they'll always remember it sweetly and you know romantically and no harm no foul i said that i can't say this to my young fans what he said this is the movie business this is acting you know what are you you're you're looking at it the wrong way i said well it's the only way i can look at it and so they went ahead and made that movie without me uh joanne woodward and richard beamer did it it was a colossal flop oh but in my case, because I turned that down, I went into Journey to the Center of the Earth. Oh, with James Mason. James Mason, Arlene Dahl, and Diane yeah. Baker. And, and that movie became a tremendous success for me and for the studio, where the one they wanted me to do was a terrific flop. And I'm sure Joanne Woodward and Richard Beamer were sorry that they made the film. It just was sorted. It was, it was not good. Well, now, didn't you have almost a, a I don't want to say a near-death experience, but an accident on center on, yeah. on that film? Didn't you yeah. have a problem? Yeah, during the center of the earth, I was in the scene. If you've seen the film, you would, uh, you would see where I am, the young kid, Alexander McEwen, the young Scottish lad. <laughs> Had to learn a Scottish accent and, and uh, the same... Um, teacher, Albert Dixon, that taught Judy Andrews how to do a Cockney accent for My Fair Lady, taught me how to do a Scotch, Scottish accent for Journey to the Center of the Earth. After about three days, I was so diligent about it, Buddy Adler, the head of the studio, called me and said, you know, we like the scenes we've seen you do, but we're going to have to redo the sound because we can't understand a word you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> with, with your Scottish accent, you know, I was holding me out. I was, you know, I was really taking it seriously to be a young Scottish boy. So anyway, I'm doing the film and I'm lost from everybody and we're down toward the center of the earth and I'm way, way, who knows, two or three miles underground <laughs> and I'm lost and it's very hot and I'm, I, I reach out to grab my canteen, which is about to slide away in a little what looked like a puddle of, of salt. In fact, I did stick my finger in it and do this and say salt. It wasn't salt. It was gypsum crystals, tiny little crystals, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of gypsum crystals that were in, that were creating the bed that I was going to fall through because I reached out for my camp, my lantern or my, uh, what, what did I say? My, my, flask or whatever it was mm -hmm. I reached out and all of a sudden the bottom dropped out and I start a several hundred foot descent through tunnels and it's supposed to be salt but it wasn't salt it was tiny gypsum like plastic crystals tiny and and all of a sudden I was submerged in those and they were pouring in on top of me while I was lying there waiting oh, for oh. The director to yell cut Meanwhile, I was really, really, literally being buried alive where I couldn't even move. And I'm, my head is straining to keep my nose up because if I know if I breathe these crystals, they're going to be in my lungs forever and it could suffocate me. And the guy up there on the, ga on the catwalk said, Mr. Le Levin, the director, you didn't yell cut. You better get Mr. Boone out of there quick. And so, oh, yeah, cut. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, because uh, there were three cameras and he was checking all of them. And so they reached in and dug me out of there. I mean, about literally 30 seconds or more or, or less from then, I was going to be suffocating, breathing in these crystals in my lungs. And there'd be no way to get them out. They wouldn't dissolve. They would be in my lungs oh. for the rest of my life. Oh. So thank God I got out of that. And it was, uh, it literally was a near death experience. 
Well, that's why I said I didn't want to dramatize it, but then I really thought that that was the truth and that you could have been yeah. seriously damaged. Well, then, of course, then uh, in the main attraction with uh, Nancy Kwan, uh, I learned to do trapeze stuff. And I was up 30 feet in the air. And Shirley, my wife, she was nervous about me learning how to go up a rope like Martin, like uh, Marlon Brando in that movie he did where he was paraplegic and he went up a rope um, arm over arm. I got to where I could do that. And so uh, Shirley was worried about me swinging from a trapeze. So she came over at, to the studio and took some lessons like I was taking lessons on how to swing out and pull up onto the, pull myself up on that trapeze. She got, she could do it better than I could because she had that s rhythmic sense of timing and she could, put, she could pull herself right up on the, on the uh, seat of the, uh, of the trapeze or the bar while I was still struggling, but I got to where I could do it. Meanwhile, in London, we're filming and we're 30 feet in the air and there's a net under me because they're shooting up at me, but then they have to shoot from above looking down with no net. And the oh. sound that the stunt man who was going to do my stuff on the trapeze when they were shooting from above with no net came in from Rome where he'd been shooting on Cleopatra with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton. And he'd been drinking too much with Richard and he came in and he couldn't do the stunt. He couldn't do what I was supposed to do. So I convinced the director and the people on the film, I said, look, let me do it without the net because I know what I'm doing. And I, it taken a settle and torch to make me let go of the bar. <laughs> so, so they did, they filmed me, uh, doing the stuff on the trapeze. Oh, for goodness sakes. In the air without a net, because I had already shown with the net I could do it. Yeah, but I'm surprised they let you do that. You're the well, star. Either that, if I, if I didn't get it the first take or two, or if I got hurt. Yeah. Uh, th that it would take many days to get set up again. Maybe I wouldn't be able to do it. So, and they didn't have anybody to take my place. So... I, they had already seen me do it, so I convinced them to let me uh, to do the stuff. I often wondered if you had a double for any of your work. No. No? Because no, mm -mm. those but are two I've examples. I that much that was dangerous. I really... Well, those two, those two that you just mentioned, those, those were dangerous. Two. But, yeah. of course, uh, you know, when you're talking about Mama Shirley, uh, you, I can remember when she drove up with Evil Knievel to my home on a motorcycle. Yeah. And in order to come down to your home, I got on the back with Evil Knievel. You introduced me to so many people, the two of you. I mean, the two of you had people coming in, going out, praying, baptized in the pool. I mean, I mean, teaching me so much. Thank you. Uh, but I mean, I never would get on a motorcycle ever again after riding with him. But the fact she knew how to do it so well. Yeah, oh, she was good. She really, Shirley was a natural athlete. Uh, wonderful balance, tempo, rhythm, great dancer. And so she just took to it like a duck of water. However, she, she had an accident, which I did not have on my motorcycle. I had one on my bicycle, broke my jaw later. But on the motorcycle, she went up on, on Mulholland and was really going with some other friends on motorcycles who were more schooled than she was and going around a curve on Mulholland, she hit some gravel, some sandy gravel. Oh yeah. Making a curve and the, and the motorcycle just slid right out from under her and she went scudding along on her back. I don't think she had a helmet on it. So she had uh, the rest of her life, a little scar on the back of her head. Of course her hair always covered it. But I knew there was that little scar back there and down her back. And so she never got on a motorcycle again. And she would never let me get any of my grandkids or my own kids on after I had a couple more motorcycles and a Harley Davidson. And she would never let me take anybody, any of my kinfolk on a motorcycle because she had, she saw what it was experience. to fall. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I was fortunate. I never did 
never did have an accident on my motorcycle. Pat, when you were uh, under contract at uh, 20th Century Fox, mm-hmm. uh, one of your couple of your people down in the little rooms was one of them, Gary Grant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I my dressing room. I don't know whether I consciously, I don't remember how I was lucky enough to have the dressing room closest to the commissary. So that when we, most of us broke for lunch around the same times in the movies that were being shot. And of course, if whoever was closest to the commissary would get in line first to get his food. So my con- my dressing room was the closest to the commissary. And then, and then, um, th- then there was another dressing room. And then on the other side of that dressing room was Elvis. The one in between was Cary Grant. I couldn't now, Cary, believe it. He rarely came into the commissary because he would have him bring him a sandwich or some soup, and he would sit out there uh, between, you know, on the lunch break with a reflector, just making sure that his his face was dark tan, he, and his face evidently had enough olive oil in his. Uh, in his skin, he could handle it. He never got burned as far as I know, but he just wanted to keep that deep, dark tan always. And so it was Presley, Pat, and then in between, Cary Grant. Oh, my, at 20th Century. And of course, you've done 15, 16 movies. And of course, I started with Cross and the Switchblade, you know, because Mm -hmm. that's where I remember. And then you did Bernadette, which was a great film. Bernadine, Bernadine. Bernadine. Bernadette was another movie. That was the song of Bernadette, which was about a nun or a Catholic, I think, uh, story. Bernadine was a Broadway musical um, written by a woman named Margaret Chase. And the music on the movie, was, uh, that was a play. Then we added music to it. And Johnny Mercer, the great yeah. songwriter, wrote right. the songs for our movie. And, of course, one, the title song was, Oh, Bernadine, Oh, 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 Bernadine. And that was a song by the great songwriter, Johnny Mercer. But on the other side of that record of Bernadine was a song we had to do something else as a B-side. And we needed another song in the film anyway. So we picked a song that Bing Crosby had done years before called Love Letters in the Sand. And that was the the B-side of Bernadine. It wasn't the A-side. The A-side, Bernadine, sold over a million records because I was hot. But then the DJs got tired of playing Bernadine, so they turned it over to see what was on the other side. And it was on a day like today. We passed the time away. And um, and that was the four million seller where Bernadine, the A side, sold a million. And so it was, I mean, it was just, it was like I felt at that time I could record a page out of the phone book and it would be a hit. Well, actually, when you would sing, I mean, I saw you as recently as last year singing. I mean, it's not like way ago. I mean, you're always doing and going and doing something somewhere, everywhere. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's who you are. Uh, but I think the one that I I loved personally so much, but the one I hear about so much with the movies, and I'm not talking about Anne Margaret, I'm talking about The Kiss. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was a, a serious smooch, <laughs> but not in the movie April Love with Shirley Jones, because there was not a kiss in the script. It was only my second movie. Right. And right. when the director at the end of this musical number on a Ferris wheel in Lexington, Kentucky said, now when you, you and Shirley or Shirley Jones are already, your characters are really strongly attracted. So when you get to the end of this song, you lean down and kiss her. And I said, on the lips? He said, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I said, but that's not in the script, Henry, the director. Well, no, but he said, you, you know, people want to see you kiss the leading lady. And you guys are your characters in love. And I said, but listen, I haven't, I know this sounds naive, but you know, I didn't know I was going to be making movies. And all of a sudden here I am, but I haven't discussed kissing scenes with my own wife, Shirley. She likes Shirley Jones fine, but I don't want to come home and say I spent half the day kissing Shirley Jones without her knowing about it. He said, I said, can we do it later in the film? Well, okay, but this would have been a great spot. This would be a great spot to kiss her. So I talked to Shirley Boone that night, and and she said, I'm way ahead of you. 
<laughs> uh, if you're if you're going to be doing movies, I know there's going to be some kissing, but promise me one thing. I said anything. She said you won't enjoy it. <laughs> I said okay, I promise. <laughs> And I came back the next day ready to say, okay, I can kiss Shirley Jones. To my astonishment, it was already in the trade papers, the Daily Variety, Hollywood Reporter. Pat Boone refused to kiss leading lady, and they assumed it's for religious reasons, which it was not. I kept saying it's not religious. I just want to stay married to this woman, and I didn't know if it was going to be a problem. Well, telegrams started flowing in from around the country because, I mean, immediately people wiring said, stick to your guns, boy. Finally, there's somebody with morals in the movie business. And, and they were congratulating me on taking a stand that I really hadn't taken. I just <laughs> wanted to make sure that it was okay with my wife if I kissed Shirley Jones for a few, few times. But because it was now established theoretically, temporarily, that I wouldn't kiss the leading lady. I didn't kiss Shirley Jones in that movie. Later, 50 years later, they did a refurbished, you know how they take a film and they redo the, the film and they, they clean it and they, I don't know what they do to it, but they make it look sparkling new. And so they had a new print of April Love at the Cinema, Cinema, Cinerama Dome, not the Cinerama Dome, but Cinematheque. And they had Shirley Jones, Marty Ingalls, and me. Shirley Boone wasn't there that night, but Shirley Jones and I agreed that we didn't kiss 50 years earlier, so we could at least, we owed each other one kiss. And Marty Ingalls said, yeah, but I'm watching you <laughs> from his wheelchair. So when the film had been seen, we'd seen the movie, and now we're being interviewed afterwards for the audience, and they talk about this, that the fact I didn't kiss her in the film, I said, but... But now my wife and, Sh and Shirley Jones' husband, Marty, have said it's okay that we have one kiss. So let's do it, Shirley. Okay, we'd agree ahead of time. We would. And I said, no, I'm directing it. So we're two teenagers, and we're just going to come slowly, close and close. And this, they're filming it. Somebody's got film footage of this. <laughs> I don't know where. And I'm coming closer. And, Sh and Shirley Jones turns her cheek. I said, wait a minute. No, no, it's not on the cheek. We're just two teenagers, but it's, and it's not going to be fatal attraction. I'm not going to slam you against a wall or something. But it's just a little, just a little teenage, innocent kiss. So that's what we did, and I and I kissed her just on her lips, very tenderly, and backed away. And uh, Marty Ingalls applauded, and the audience thought it was great. And somewhere there is a film. I mean, it's on film somewhere. And I came home and told Shirley, and I said, but I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> a little white lie, just a little bit of a white lie. Because I did enjoy the fact that at least after 50 years, I did that first kiss. But now with Anne Margaret, which is what you brought up. Yes. That was, that was a serious kiss. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and if you ask me if I enjoyed it, I'll say no comment. Okay. But, uh, uh, <laughs> even though Shirley's not here, but um, but that was in the script and it had to happen. And by then, of course, Shirley had already given me the permission to do kissing in the film. And I, and I must say, though, I liked Anne Margaret a lot, and, and her husband Roger. You know, I it was only that it was a a screen kiss, but. But it was a legitimate kiss. Then after that, of course, I kissed Debbie Reynolds, Diane Baker, yeah. Barbara Eden. Yeah, you had s several. A few, but I just wasn't known as the great screen lover. Yes, I can kiss. I love kissing. <laughs> but, but I didn't make a career of it. You know, it must have been um, in the early days when you were starting out before you did these 15, 16 films, movies, 20th Century Fox contract, when you were the teenage idol. Mm. And you had, help me now, was it 220 consecutive weeks that you were on the charts? Yes. Yeah, you're right. Uh, that's a record I hold in the record business. You've done some homework, I can see that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, 220 weeks consecutively. 
on the Billboard charts always with at least one record, usually two, one going up and the other coming down. Because Randy Wood at Dot Records, that was his uh, method, as soon as a record peaked at number seven, if it dropped to number nine, out came the next record. If it went to number 32 and dropped to 39, boom, out came the next record. So for over four years, I was never, not one week, off the charts, 220 consecutive weeks. The closest anybody that any of us have found that has come to that is Elton John, who was on the charts for about 157 weeks mm -hmm. straight. Because even people like Mariah Carey and and uh, Whitney Houston and others who who may have been on the charts longer for longer years, they weren't always on consecutive weeks because a record can come off the chart and then they release a new record. But but we didn't wait for that. Soon as a record started to drop, out came the next record. So we tried to maintain the momentum. And it really worked. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't aware of it then, and I didn't know till Dick Clark made us aware many years later that that is a record I hold, 220 yeah. consecutive weeks on the charts. And then he asked another question on with, uh, with Merv Griffin <clears throat> once. He asked me and Merv uh, to guess which record was longer on the charts in a number of weeks. Uh, hey Jude by the Beatles or Don't Be Cruel, Elvis Presley, or Love Letters in the Sand, Pat Boone. Well, I thought that's nice of him to add one of mine. So I said, I felt it was uh, Hey Jude, the Beatles. And Merv guessed it was Don't Be Cruel, Elvis. Dick said, no, it was Love Letters in the Sand. It was on the, on the charts longer consecutive weeks than Hey Jude or Don't Be Cruel. But when these things are happening, you don't know it. I wasn't keeping up with it. It was not something we set out to do. It just happened. And later, maybe years later, you find out. Well, the fact that that happened and the favor that you have been given throughout your life and what you have given back, by the way, which we're going to go into in our second part here of conversation with Pat Boone, the one, yes, and the only, and I'm privileged and I'm honored and I thank you for taking this time for us. I just want you to know that I have to ask a personal question here. Are you related to Daniel Boone? I have to know. Definitely, yes, yes. I'm descended from his eldest son, James. Uh, he had 10 kids. You know, people thought I was prolific. Uh, <laughs> we had four in three and a half years, but Shirley and I, but then that was it. We found out what was causing them. And, uh, and then, <laughs> no, Daniel Boone and his wife, Rebecca, they had 10 kids. And uh, I am direct descendant from Daniel. We've done all the genealogy, and uh, I am very proud of that because he truly was a legend in his own time. Yes. Uh, in that Lord Byron, the great English poet laureate, wrote an epic poem about this pioneer he'd only read about. He never met Daniel Boone, but he heard about this pioneer who'd been prominent in the American Revolution and then was helping people... Um, to discover what was thought of as the great American West, as far West as Illinois, <laughs> not knowing how much further the West lay. But uh, Daniel Boone was a legend, literally, in his own time, and quite a guy. I mean, he lived to be 85, 86, and I'm 86 now. And he, at 84, with his son, was building their home in Joplin, Missouri. Yes. from Kentucky to uh, outside J what's now Joplin. And ho the house is still there. I've been there to see this beautiful stone house that they built. And I don't know how in the world they moved these huge stones. It was almost like the pyramids. Yeah. The house is still there, though. And uh, so he did good work, Daniel Boone. Yes. And isn't it wonderful to be related to each other? Yeah. But I've always wanted to ask you that question. I have so many more things here. Um, I'm just going to take a segue to say that I am astonished and blown away 
I know you're writing a book. We'll get to that. And I understand that. But I was amazed because I thought I knew the Boons and the family and Ryan's Reach and all these things so much. I had no idea of how many books you have written. Yeah, I've lost track, actually. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 I won't even bother to try to. I mean, not that it's so many. It might be 15 to 20 books, but uh, I just haven't been doing them to count them or the m- number of movies that I've made or song. I have not, I have numbered the s- numbers of songs that I've recorded. 2,000 what? 2,000 what? 2,300 songs. Okay. Frank Sinatra recorded 1,500. So, uh, Bing Crosby, who was my role model, uh, did some 2,000 songs. That's a way of a lot of music. I was stunned to find out that I have recorded over 2,300 songs because... You know, I've recorded in so many genres, country, some 20 country albums, more than 20 gospel albums, uh, pop, rock and roll, patriotic, movie themes, love ballads, novelties, (laughs) you know, just, I've just been a recording fool. I just loved recording. It, uh, it's the part where people ask me, what part of your career do you enjoy most? Live performing or movies or television? I said, no, recording. I love to go in a studio with a good song or songs and record something. And if I like it, and I, don't, I hardly ever do anything that I don't like, I only regret doing two or three songs in my whole, out of the 2,300. I, I did them because I liked them and I enjoyed doing it. And uh, plus now you've got something that is a little momentary capsule of who you are at that time. I hear, I hear myself singing today songs I did when I was 25, 30, 40, realizing I couldn't sing quite that well. I still sing, but but I couldn't sing with the ease and the flexibility that I did back then when whatever you put in front of me, I could just do it. Didn't matter if it was opera, if it was uh, something from Broadway, a movie theme, rock and roll, country, gospel, patriotic. I love my recording of the national anthem. Oh, yes. Patriotic songs. I mean, um, your recordings are exceptional and your videos that you've done, which I'm going to go into with your permission, because um, (laughs) if if the song hasn't been written out there, folks, and you want someone to write a song for a deep needed cause, call Pat Boone, would you please? Um, Because that's what he said. Oh, by the way, the questions about God that you wrote with uh, Cord Cooper, I think it was. Yeah. Those questions, I mean, compared to Stephen Hawkins and Einstein and some of the work you've done in these books and the research, you're like a walking encyclopedia. Well, I, I credit Cord with a lot of that research because he came to me with the the beginning of a, of a book, a lot of it written with the, with the details. Uh, and, and he wanted me to help him because he was not, he was a writer for the investor business daily and for investment papers, but he was by nature and by training a research, uh, uh, expert. And he was, he had written stuff that scientifically proved the existence of God beyond any reasonable question. And also that the Bible is the inspired word of God. And that, therefore, Jesus is the Son of God, because both God himself and his word both say, as Jesus himself said, yes, I am the Son of God. So these are three very important questions that we wanted uh, everybody to know the valid answers for. But uh, Cord felt he needed somebody to help him make the book more presentable to the average reader. So I was delighted to do it. I said, look, Cord, if this was already a finished book, I would order a hundred copies because of the content of it to, to oh. get to all my friends. <laughs> but yes, if you want me to help and write some more of it with you and add my own personal experience and insights. And we did it. So it's a collaborative work. He's been gone now for some time, but yes, I do think we prove beyond any question. And we quote some pretty good scientists like Albert Einstein and, <laughs> And Hawking, Hawkins, Stephen Hawking, mm-hmm. and uh, the father of uh, 
of evolution. Um, uh, why do I always get Darwin? Name? Darwin, yeah, Charles Darwin. His name, first name, is same as mine. <laughs> but um, but yeah, uh, they all say they don't want to use the name God, but they all say there is a spirit abroad in the universe. There is an intelligence that this idea, this Big Bang theory, which they completely uh, reject, that somehow there was a giant cataclysmic explosion of forces. And from that evolution over billions and millions of years, out came these perfect creations we call human beings and flowers and animals and the cosmos working in absolute precision. I mean, greater than clockwork precision. So we can send something to another planet and, and bring it back again because we know that everything is going to keep right on operating to the nth degree. Anyway, these scientists, being scientists, said there obviously is an intelligence beyond ours. There is a, a spirit abroad, I think, as Stephen Hawking said, in the universe. And I ask in my book that I've just finished, why can't they pronounce a simple word, G-O-D? It's pronounced God. <laughs> why can't they pronounce the word God? They don't want to, because if they pronounce and acknowledge <laughs> that there is a God who can create all things, including us, that there may be some responsibility we should feel toward that creator. Maybe, maybe he expects something from us if he created this whole world and everything in it, and we are his ultimate creation. Yes, their, their suspicion is correct. <laughs> they just don't want to acknowledge that there is a God. So they say, but what we understand, we'll, we can understand the science, so we'll deal with it. What they're not acknowledging is the science comes from God. There would be no science were it not from the creator who set it all in motion and, um, and who, who made it all possible. So the Bible says clearly, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So by definition, anybody like Bill Maher, poor sap, who <laughs> says there is no God is a fool by the biblical definition. Because Einstein and Hawking... And Charles Darwin, I think, know a little more about science than Bill Maher. And they all said, well, we may not want to call it God or him God, but there's obviously a creator. There's obviously an intelligence. There's obviously, a, as they say, a spirit abroad. We just don't want to have to acknowledge that it's God any more than Bill Maher wants to. Because it will imply maybe, maybe we're supposed to do something about this this person, this intelligence that created everything, maybe he wants something of us and maybe he'll do something for us if we'll approach him, <laughs> which of course is what our faith in God is about. We do approach the creator and he does love us and he does want to bless us. And he does bless us. And there's yeah. no way you could get the top of your head to the bottom of your toes without this wonderful design called the body. That's right. I yes. mean, look at our bodies. Look at our oh, retinas. Look at our pupils. I mean, wonderfully made. Yeah. I mean, we really, ourselves are evidence of the Creator. Amen. When it's you hold so, a little baby in your arms, and you realize that you and your mate created another human being that's now looking at you, and I mean, you know, if you don't acknowledge the fact that there's a God, then you're there's something deficient in your understanding of reality. I was touched, a segue to your point right now, with Let Me Live. Mm. Did you, yeah, the song that you wrote in 1983, I believe it was 83, uh, about the unborn child, that we should learn to love the born as we do the unborn. Uh -huh. The song you wrote, Pat, you yeah. wrote this song. Yeah. I'm amazed. Uh, and you put a video, of course, with it. Well, the that came about because of Ronald Reagan. I mean, I already had my feelings about abortion. I mean, I knew what I, anybody can tell that's wrong to kill a baby. 
whether and to think that it's all right to kill the baby just because it hasn't been seen yet is really <laughs> it's it is a, a moral blindness to think that because not one of us there's not one single person in existence who wasn't also a fetus who wasn't in some woman's womb not one of us none of us came to be without coming through that process so therefore every single human being today was a human being before he or she came out of the womb and to kill that child just because it's still in the womb and not wanted is terribly wrong i think it should be very obvious that it is it always has been so now it, the, the focus is on the woman's right. Yeah, the woman has the right, and she is the one that makes the choice. But what is the choice? The choice is to let the baby live or die. And it is, anyway, knowing this, when Ronald Reagan was president, uh, abortion was still a hot-button issue, and he felt he needed to express himself clearly. And his think tank around him was saying, no, chief, don't wait till you're reelected before you write a book about, he did write a book called Abortion and the Conscience of a Nation. They said, wait till you're reelected before you write this book. He said, well, <laughs> can you promise me that I'll be reelected? And they said, well, we believe you will. Well, but uh, you can't promise me. And I'm going to use the bully pulpit while I have it, because I feel strongly. So he wrote this book, and in that book, which I read, a short book filled with truism, uh, he, he asked the rhetorical, he, he raises a rhetorical issue. It's a shame that the one whose life is most irrevocably affected in this matter can't be heard from. That is the child, not yet born. And that impacted me so that I had a waking vision of children, of a child crying in the womb, let me live, let, let me walk into the sunlight, let me live, feel my mother's love surround me, feel my father's love, you know, my mother's love around me, my father's love surround me, be a part of God's creation, let me live. And I wrote the song, and of course, I picture in the song, uh, first one child, then a second, and more, and then more, and then more, till there were innumerable kids all crying to, to be allowed to live, to walk into the sunlight and feel their mother's love and their father's protection. And they weren't yet born. And so I got kids from church on the way, my home congregation, to be the voices of the little children, the one month old child, I'm one month old today, and I have fingers and toes, and just describing his creation at one month, and then two months, and then three months, and as the child is growing, and yet the chorus keeps growing, first one or two voices, and then finally, the whole big chorus of children singing that song let me live let me live let me walk into the oh. sunlight let me live feel my mother's love surround me feel my uh, around me surround me be a part of god's creation let me live and then i said i realized that that although there were thousands of these singing that not one had yet been born well that vision that song was then turned into a video at PTL and then CBN. And they did a video showing children in those various stages of, of their development from one month in actual photographs taken from within the womb uh, by these cameras that they had, the technology that were in Life magazine and so on. And you could see the children's development as the song was going along as they were growing to be, to be, they were almost about to be born. And I do know that it saved thousands of lives. I've held children's, I've held little babies in my hands that whose mothers allowed them to live when they heard the song. They were on their way to have an abortion or were seriously planning to have an abortion. And then they said, wait a minute, that's my child singing to me. And, um, 
one of the most dramatic moments came. I was in uh, Sacramento at a pro-life meeting when the song had been out for a couple of years. And, and, and I knew I had saved the song. It saved many lives. And this uh, teenage girl, still a girl, put her little baby in my hand. She said, I was at a pro-life rally, and she said, this little child na I named Adam is uh, I allowed to live because I heard your song. And so, of course, I, somebody took a picture, but I didn't keep it. I didn't have it for some reason. 20 years later, I'm back in Sacramento, pro-life convention. And, and I asked ahead of time if anybody there knew about that little kid, Adam. Oh, yeah. He's a high school senior now. He's on the football team. He sings the <laughs> national anthem at the uh, football games. He's a student leader. Oh, he's a phenomenal young man. I said, well, can, can you have him at that convention? Because I'm going to be there. And I didn't take a picture in my arms when he was a little baby. But I want to get a picture with him this time now, almost 20 years later, 19 years later. Well, he was there, crew cut, strong, 190 pound kid. And I said, Adam, I want to bring you on stage. And I'm going to ask people to have their cameras ready. And when I reach down to pick you up, I want you to have your arm on my shoulder and help me, help me, because you weigh 190. <laughs> I only weighed 185. So I have a picture in my book, Pat Boone's America, 50 years, that big picture. Yes, book. we have it right back here. And there's a picture of me with this 90-pound guy in my arms. And then I put him down, and I say, look, I think the more appropriate picture, because I weigh less than he does. And I said, Adam, and pick me up. And I, I put my arm on his shoulder to help, and he picked me up with less effort than it took me to lift him, I guarantee you. So 20 years, and now it's 40 years, of, of that song being out there and people hearing it and, uh, and the children singing to them from their mother's wombs, in effect. And that little kid who played the one-year-old and the three-year-old, I mean, the one-month and three-month-old child was the voice. Turned out later, his parents told me that they felt they were really tearful about letting him do this with me because when she learned that she was pregnant and they weren't married, she was going to have an abortion. And then she decided she couldn't do it. And she allowed him to live. And he is the voice, that child they allowed to live after they became Christians, is the voice of the one-month and the three-month-old child in that record. So we knew that God was engineering this whole thing. That's uh, an incredible story. It really is. I, I also want to mention just three well, you've done so much, it's hard for me to be brief, but I'm trying. I, 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 you wrote, just let me mention these, because we're going to show these uh, pieces uh -huh. of, of, of footage from your video, which oh, is, good. you wrote the anthem called My Country, concerning the National Guard, because you realized that we didn't have a song yeah, for the for, National Guard. For my country, for my country. For my country. The ballad of the National uh -huh. Guard, because we have songs about the Army, Navy, Marines, and the... Uh -huh. Who to leave our Army, Navy, Air Force. Air Force. But we didn't have a song for the National Guard. And of course, so many of our young men and women were, were when I wrote this, they were in Afghanistan and Pakistan and in the Middle East and risking their lives and limbs. And, mm -hmm. and as it was in Vietnam days, many of us not quite sure why they were there or what do we think we were accomplishing. But they were there, they were asked by their country, and they were doing it. And, um, and so I wrote a song called uh, For My Country, The Ballad of the National Guard. And uh, I'm really very proud of that song because it speaks for and in the voice of the men and women who really literally laid their lives on the line. Some paid with their lives, others with their limbs, sacrifice their futures, uh, families. I mean, and then, then in, in, included with that song, and it features the lowest bass singer ever recorded. For my country. He's about 10 times lower than that. 
uh, and the song. But we also did a documentary, which I paid for, a documentary of the National Guard itself, because so few people know that the National Guard began back when we were just colonies from England. And, uh, and there was, there were just a little militia that was formed from farmers who were fighting for their freedoms and, uh, and for liberty. And out of those militias grew what came to be known as the National Guard. And now Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, uh, military come many cases out of the National Guard into the other branches of service. Well, I think that you, I don't know what year you wrote this, but it had to be after 9-11, correct? Yes. Yeah, yes. Well, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the standpoint of a guy who says, when 9-11 happened, I couldn't just stay home. Um, I went downtown and asked the guard to train me. Now I'm a fighting man, and I give my country everything I've got. And um, so he was not there. He said, I know why I'm out here. Oh, no, I don't want to stay here. This place is not my home. It's a deadly, dirty job that must be done. But I know why I'm out here. I know my cause is just, and I do what I do for my country. Amen. So that title, that for my country, is the title. That's beautiful. And then you went on to write three more. One I was very familiar with because of Israel. But uh, the other two I'll mention first, which is, I Can't We Get Along? And then, of course... I had a dream with Martin Luther King Jr. that yeah. you wrote as a tribute. And yeah. then the, the one that I think everyone knows you um, concerning Masada and Israel. Yeah, Exodus. Yeah. Exodus. And did, is it true? I could have it wrong with one of your many songs. Did you write that on a napkin? No, I wrote it on the back of a Christmas card. Okay. <laughs> it was a Christmas card. I, it was Christmas Eve, and I was trying to come up with words for that melody that had been written by Ernest Gold for the movie Exodus. Bum, 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 bum. Had no words. And I wanted to sing that melody, especially since I'd read not only Leon Uris' book Exodus, but Moses' book by the same name in the Bible. So I knew the whole history of the people of Israel, wanted to sing it, but there weren't any words. So it was Christmas Eve, and surely my wife was begging me to come help her get the presents under the tree so we could go to bed and get some sleep before the girls got us up Christmas morning. And I was listening to the Ferrani Teicher piano version, instrumental of that song over and over to try to get words in my mind I could sub- submit to or propose to a professional writer. I wasn't thinking about writing the words myself, just wanted to get an idea. So I said, honey, wait just a minute. I'm going to play this one more time. I put the needle on the record. Bum, 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 bum. And the words just came to me. This land is mine. And I said, wait a minute. I took the needle. I said, that's the whole story of Exodus. This land is mine. I put the needle. Bum, 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 bum. The words came. God gave this land to me, and I realize it's a personal statement, not a collective statement on the part of millions of people. No, it's one person saying, God gave this land to me, and to my, and of course I said, to take my hand and walk this land. I knew that men and women fought and and dared together to, to make Israel a nation. So take my hand and walk this land with me. When the morning sun reveals her hills and plains, I see a land where children can run free. And those words, I s- swear that uh, uh, that I wrote those words almost as fast as I could put the needle back on the music and let it play another little portion, and then the words would come. And in about 25, 30 minutes tops, I had written the words on the back of a the only white surface I could put my hands on, and it was the back of a Christmas card. So now that Christmas card on which I wrote those words is in the in Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, and on the wall of the righteous Gentile, where they want it to be displayed along with Ros- Oscar Schindler, Corey Ten Boom, and the others who, Christians who, who did save the lives of uh, 
of Jews from Nazi terrorism, Holocaust, and so on. And I'm just grateful and pleased and, and yes, proud that the, the words I wrote, um, the head of the Yad Vashem says, we have a campaign underway. We want every Jewish child in Israel to know those words. They may not be able to sing the song. It's not the easiest song to sing, but it's a beautiful song. And we want to at least know those words. This land is mine. God gave this land to me personally. I think that when you go from having Elvis Presley open for you <laughs> as an act to Israel, Exodus in conversation, this is such a widespread. It is. Uh, I mean, it is so. And not to mention when you came up to Rock Hudson's home, when nobody, nobody would come. They were leaving as fast. Afraid to be around him. That's right. When yeah. we had AIDS and, and, and what you've done for the race card, as I call it, what mm -hmm. you've done for our fellow brothers and sisters of color and what you have done for Israel and what you have done for your family and what you have done for Christianity and what you have done to make a difference in this world. Ah, I'm not so bad for a teacher preacher. <laughs> That's what I, <laughs> what I thought I was going to be. But, but you are kind know, of a preacher, you know what I mean? Well, in a, in a way, yes, my, my songs. And of course, I will, I will preach at the drop of a hat or a question. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not bashful about saying what I do believe. And of course, the book I'm finishing up now, finished, if. called If. The book is simply called If, the one word. And that if refers to the question of heaven or hell. God's answer to that if is he wants you to come to heaven. He's made all the arrangements. He's invited you. He wants you to come and live for eternity with him. That's his choice. The other choice of the other side of the if is what is your choice? What do you want? Do you want to come to heaven? Are you, would you like to spend eternity when this life is over? Would you like to spend an eternity with the creator himself in heaven? If you would, then, of course, you ought to investigate what you have to do to be sure that your name is on the list, <laughs> on, the, on the invitation list. And it's, it's that stark. I think it's that blunt, that direct. It's, I'm saying as a, on the front of the cover, which is simply the word if. If. But above it is, I say, this is not religious. It's life or death. And... Not if, everybody wants to look at it that way. If we but, were going to buy it, where would we buy it if we well, were to buy not, it? It will, it will be in all bookstores and promoted on television elsewhere in the fall. It's not okay. out. I'm, okay. I'm writing, and there's going to be a big picture section in there, too, so that people can know who it is that's, that's uh, presenting them with this if. Well, uh, more than you had in, in your your books that I have back here together, okay. side by side. I mean, look at all the fun There things. were so many pictures. Yeah, no, there won't be that many because it was really all about me and about Shirley and our family. Mm -hmm. But this book is not about me, although the publisher, when I told him that I had to write this book, if he said, I want you, we want to publish it, but you're going to be writing for people who don't know who you are. There's 150 million people in this country that I'm writing for who don't go to church, who don't, according to the polls, they, they may not even pray. They don't know if there is a God. They don't know. They're ignorant. I don't mean that negatively. They simply do not know. If you ask them, uh, is there a God? Well, I don't know. Uh, if there is a God, are you? is there a heaven or a hell? I don't know that either. Well, if there is a heaven or a hell, do you think you're going to go to heaven? I don't know. Uh -huh. I mean, so I'm, I'm writing for those who are ignorant, literally ignorant about what the Bible says, about who God is, about how much he loves us, about how much he wants every one of us to come and live with him. But we don't just go there because we'd like to. <laughs> he, he's inviting us 
but he's inviting us to an eternal home. And you don't come into anybody's home just because you'd like to pop in there. Uh, you'd like to sidle in without b- being known. No, you have to know the, uh, the one who owns that home and who wants you to come. He's inviting you. He wants you to come, but you have to get to meet him. You have to get to know him. You have to, he wants to know, are you going to be a, a worthy guest in his home? And so it's, I try to put it on very human, understandable terms, but it is, it is a matter of life and death. It, it truly is, which is why I feel like I, it may be probably is my last book. Oh, and you it, say things are your last and they're never your last. Well, I don't know. I certainly don't plan to write another book after this. <laughs> but then again, I didn't plan to write this book until about a year and a half ago. And then the song I'm writing, Yehoshua, which is the Hebrew name of Jesus as revealed by, by Israel's uh, most revered rabbi, Rabbi Itzhak Kaduri, at 105 years old still teaching his followers and a close friend and supporter of Prime Minister Netanyahu, who was a friend of mine. But he was in, he came out of his study on the Day of Atonement and, um, and told his followers, the rabbinical students, the Messiah has appeared to me. He's told me his name. I know the name of the Messiah. And I've written it down and I will seal it in an envelope. I don't want it open till a year after my passing. But after I'm gone, you open it up and I will have written the name of the Messiah in Hebrew. And I was telling this to Prime Minister Netanyahu two years ago in in Israel. And I said, so your friend, Prime Minister Netanyahu, wrote the name and reveals the name of the Messiah. And Netanyahu said, which is? I said, Yehoshua. And I heard him say, Jesus. Yes. Yeshua. Yeshua is the word salvation in Hebrew. And that was Jesus' name, but the full name was Yehoshua. Jehovah is salvation. And that's what the rabbi said the Messiah had told him is his name. Yehoshua. Jehovah is salvation, from which we get Yeshua, the one word salvation. And of course, the the import of that, which I've never heard a minister talk about, is that wherever Jesus went in his boyhood, he was not called Jesus because that's the English version from the Greek, from Yeshua. He was called Yeshua. But it's the same as if it were translated into English, salvation. So it was as if his name was salvation. Hey, salvation, wait for us, not so fast. His name, because the angel said to Mary, telling her that she was going to bear the child of God, and his name will be, she didn't say Jesus, because that's English. (laughs) The angel said to Mary, his name will be Yehoshua. Jehovah is salvation, for he will save his people from their sins. Well, it all makes so much sense when you know that. Oh, his name is salvation, because he's going to be the Savior the Jewish Savior that, of course, will be offered to us Gentiles as well. We can be grafted into the family of God's chosen people when we receive the Jewish Messiah, whose name is Yehoshua. So I've written a song, and uh, Michael Omardian is right, finishing it with me, and I'm going to go to Nashville as soon as the coronavirus will let me and put my voice on that song. So that it will be like, except I didn't, my voice is not only can we get along. That's another thing addressing the coronavirus and the divisions that are tearing our country apart. But you're right, Susan. I, a, prophet, a prophet has told me once that God was going to cause songs to fly out of me like birds. That was a weird statement to make. We were on a cruise, Shirley and I. And this Christian woman with a prophetic gift said to me in our stateroom that God has shown me he's, you're going to write a lot of songs and they're going to fly out of you like birds. 
<laughs> and I, I didn't know what that meant. But all those years since, without my meaning to, to make that come true, when the, when the impulse comes and the vision comes for a song, I just feel compelled to go ahead and write it. And then I write it. And it's usually about a cause, about something that needs to yeah. be done. And that's what you're all about. Hmm. That's why this tribute, the Pat Boone tribute, is to you, Pat. Because not only have you made a difference, but you continue to make a difference. And you're showing people how to live under the harshest ways of losing a loved one, but knowing you're going to see her again, because that's the word of God. When yeah. You're absent from the body. You are present with the Lord. And that's what you're yeah. doing for so many of us. And how can I say thank you? I love your heart. I love your integrity. I love what you stand for. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, you're my sweet sister, and you know that. Thank you, Pat. We love you. Now you can get some water. <laughs> I had a little cold coffee, but that helped. Okay. In Christ we stand. Yes. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>